Of course, this being a big day for baptisms, um, I thought it would be appropriate to pe preach on the subject. Now, I know I preached on this uh, particular subject uh, about a month or two ago. And I, I remember preaching at that time thinking, you know, a lot of the people that, um, that needed to hear it uh, weren't there. So I thought, you know, especially with a lot of the little kids here, um, it's important that they understand what baptism is. And uh, I'm sure they already have an understanding of that. But uh, let's go ahead and drive that home a little bit. And, you know, we should, it's, it's really one of the more basic, simpler doctrines in the Bible. It's not a very deep subject. It's not anything that really takes a lot of explaining. Um, really, when you deal with it, it's something that you kind of have to dispel a few um, uh, misunderstandings about baptism. Really, then you have, you have to do more of that, really, than explaining uh, what baptism is. It's more about explaining what it, is, what it isn't. And uh, so we'll just go kind of quick through this morning and, and get to the baptisms, but um, I did want to touch on this subject because it is important. I mean, after all, we're Baptist, right? So, you know, it's kind of what we're about. It's one of our, you know, distinctives is the fact that we believe in a, a believer's baptism by immersion. But one of the first things I want us to notice there in Matthew 28 is that baptism is not, an, is not optional. I mean, it is, but in the sense that you don't have to do it in order to be saved. You don't have to do it in order to go to heaven. You don't have to do it to be a member of the church. You know, you could go your whole life without getting baptized. But it is a command that God gave us, to, not only to be baptized, but to baptize others. And if, if, if you look there in, in Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus giving the Great Commission says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. So we see, first of all, that if, if Jesus is commanding others to baptize, that it only stands to reason that he's commanding other people to be baptized. So it, it's, 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 uh, it's not optional in the sense that if you want to obey the commandments of God, if you want to be pleasing unto the Lord, there is a time and place for you to be baptized. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, you know, just to kind of drive this point home a little further, you can stay, uh, uh, go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. <laughs> But baptism is a command. Uh, it says in John 1, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. So John the Baptist, even, he was sent to baptize. That was what he was given to do. That was part of the uh, commission that was given to him to go out and to baptize the multitudes. So you see that baptism often in Scripture is something that's commanded on the part of the one who is doing the baptizing. If you look there in Matthew chapter 21, we'll see more of this. It says, The baptism of John, whence was it? Of course, this is Jesus asking the Jews, asking the Pharisees, kind of, you know, trying to catch them in their words as they often try to do to him, and saying to them, you know, where was the, from whence was the baptism of John? You know, where did it come from? Was it a command of men or was it from heaven? From heaven or of men, as it says there. And they reason within themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say unto us, why then do you not believe him? So they didn't want to answer correctly. The, the correct answer is, as we saw, as I read for you in John 1, is that it was from heaven, that John the Baptist was commanded by God from heaven to go out and baptize. So baptism is a command. So in that sense, it's something that's not optional. It's something that we need to do. If we are going to be obedient unto the Lord, we need to be baptized. Amen. Not only that, but it's also the example uh, that Jesus Christ set. So whenever we see Jesus doing something, you know, we should probably take note of it. I and mean, he is the one that we are supposed to walk after and follow and, and, and try our best to, to be like him in every way. And Jesus himself was, was, uh, uh, was baptized. And if you would go over to Matthew chapter 3, and we'll take a look at, at his baptism. Matthew chapter 3, I'll begin reading in verse 13. The Bible says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And that was the whole purpose. You know, Jesus made it a point to be baptized. If you notice, it says there, He cometh uh, from Galilee uh, to Jordan unto John. You know, he wasn't just stopping by to say hi. He just wasn't checking in on things. And while he was there, he figured he'd get baptized. That was the whole purpose of him going there. He was going there to be baptized. It didn't happen by chance. You know, it was something that he purposed to do. And really, that's the way it's going to be for us. If we're going to obey this command to be baptized, we're going to have to pick a date. We're going to have to pick a time. We're going to have to pick a place that we're going to do it. We're going to have to say, this is the, you know, I'm, going to not, I'm not going to make any more excuses. I'm not going to put this off any further. I'm not going to let anything get in the way of me being baptized. I'm going to go and do it. That's right. Now, you'll do that when you realize and understand that it is something that you need to do, that it is something that God expects of us as his children. It's one of the first things that we do, as we'll see here later in a few of the other scriptures, immediately after salvation is a good time to do it, that we should be baptized after salvation. 
<clears throat> you see, the command to be baptized is for saved people. It's not for people to get saved. Go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. So we see that, first of all, baptism is a command. It's something that we're supposed to be doing as believers. And that it's the example of Jesus Christ set. He picked a place, he picked a person, he picked a time. He went there for the express purpose of being baptized. <clears throat> and not only that, but we also see here that the command to be baptized is for saved people. And it's important to make this point because a lot of people teach today that in order for you to be saved, you have to be baptized. They'll say you can't, you know, that, that baptism somehow is a part of salvation. They'll say things like, you know, uh, an example would be the Roman Catholic Church or even the Greek Orthodox Church or even some Lutheran churches. You know, they'll teach that you have to be baptized. And they don't even baptize correctly. You know, they'll baptize by sprinkling. I know the Greek Orthodox dunks, but they, they dunk infants, which is another false doctrine. You know, you can't, a, a, an infant can't get saved. They don't know any better. Right. You know, we baptize people who are old enough to have come to the place of their knowledge and understanding for salvation, who have received Christ by faith. Uh, you know, their own will. And that's who we baptize. You know, whether that's a child or an adult, that doesn't matter. But we know one thing is that an infant can't discern between right and wrong. They can't make that decision and call upon the Lord for faith. So it doesn't make any sense to baptize an infant. And not only that, the way they baptize, right? They'll do a lot. They'll take the ladle a lot of times. I don't know. I never, I was never part of the Catholic Church. I don't know a lot about it. My wife was, you know, and, and it's a pretty common knowledge that they sprinkle or they use the ladle or the little cup, I don't know what, what it is, but the point is is that they're not immersing people. They're not putting them all the way under, which we'll see here in a minute. That's the way to, be, uh, to baptize somebody. So we have to understand that this command to be baptized is for saved people. It's not for the lost. It's not in order to be saved. It's something that you do because you are saved. It says here in Acts chapter 10, beginning of verse 1, and there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band uh, uh, called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him, and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked at him, he was afraid, and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Of course, we know the re if we know are familiar with the story, he then sends those three men. Uh, Peter's up on the roof. God gives him the vision, the blanket coming down with all manner of unclean meat, uh, beasts. He tells him to rise, kill and eat. He does that three times, and it's a it's a symbol of. And he says, uh, you know, Peter refuses and says, uh, no unclean thing has come into my mouth. He says, and God tells him that which I call clean, call that not thou unclean. What that was was a picture that God was going unto the Gentiles. And that's when those three Gentile men, the Italians here, mm -hmm. show up at his gate and ask for Simon. And he goes to, back to uh, uh, Cornelius' house and talks to him. And it says there in verse 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, that he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted, accepted by him. The word which God sent of the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things, which he did, uh, did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Now to all the people, but uh, not, not to all the people, but unto Witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he arose from the dead. Then, and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and the dead. To give all the prophet, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles... Also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard him, them speak with other tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, For who uh, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed to him uh, to tarry certain days. So one thing again to point out there is the last verse that he commanded them to be baptized. He didn't suggest it. He didn't say, you know, you might want to think about this. He said, no, you need to be baptized. 
But more than that, we see here that baptism, again, is for people who are saved. And if you were noticed while I was reading that, Peter pretty much preaches the gospel. I mean, that's what he does here. He preaches the gospel, these people get saved, and then they get baptized. Yep. If you notice, first of all, he says there in verse 36, he says, The Lord, uh, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Isn't that one of the first things we tell people when, we're, when we get into the gospel with them? We say, you know, Jesus Christ was God, that he was born in the flesh that he was born a virgin, that he was coming in the flesh, God was manifest in the flesh. So when we're preaching the gospel, at least we should be explaining to people that Jesus Christ is God. And that's what Peter's doing here. Yeah. He goes on and says in verses 38 through 40, he preaches the death, burial, and resurrection. But he says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witness of these things, uh, which he did both in the land of Jews and Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. So there's your death. And his burial, whom God raised up the third day and showed him openly. So again, he preaches to them that Jesus Christ is God. Then he preaches to them the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 43, he, he preaches to them that the only thing they have to do is just believe. That salvation is by grace through faith. Right. Look there in verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Right. Now it's important to take note of that verse. It's going to come up later. That... The one thing to you need to do in order to receive the remission of sins is what? Is to believe. That's it. He didn't leave anything out. You know, he said the one thing you need to do is just believe. And that's the same thing we preach when we go out soul winning and telling people about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that the only thing you need to do in order to be saved is to simply believe on Christ, to put your trust in him. Then, of course, verses 45 through 46, you see that these people get saved. The Holy Ghost comes upon them, and they speak with other tongues, <clears throat> which is a sign that was given to certain people, you know, only those that were saved. It was a very, it was one that was normally reserved for just the apostles, but this was one of those gifts, as we talked about Thursday night, when we went through the book of Matthew, about how he would, uh, there were certain, the certain signs of an apostle. Well, this is one sign that was given not to just the apostles, but also to the early church, and that's what we see taking place here. But what happens after they get saved? What happens after they hear the preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? What happens after they hear that salvation is by grace through faith? What is it that happens after they believe? Is that's when they get baptized. Not before, not during. It's not part of the equation for salvation. It's something that takes place after somebody gets saved. You see that there in verses 47 through 48 where he says, Can any man forbid water that you should not be baptized? And he commanded them to be baptized in the Lord. And they were. Now let's go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We'll see another example. Because maybe that one's not too not cut and dry enough. Maybe that one takes a little too much explaining. And if that one went over our heads, well, let's make sure we drive this point home. Because this is an important point. Because people get mixed up on this. I mean, there's whole churches that are built around this doctrine. That you have to be baptized to be saved. I believe the, the, the Church of Christ preaches this. Yep. That if you have not been baptized, you're not going to heaven. Well, that's a false doctrine, and we want to deal with it. So we see here from Acts, uh, our first example there in Acts, but let's, uh, now let's look at Acts chapter 8 and see another example. Verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise go, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man in Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiop Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, Read uh, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. <laughs> and Philip ran thither to him <clears throat> and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before a shear. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet, this or of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip answered, and Philip said, You must be baptized if you want to get saved. That's not what he said, though. Is it? <laughs> he said this, If thou believest with all of the heart, thou mayest. Amen. So we see that belief, we see that faith is what is the prerequisite to, to baptism. <laughs> that if, if you got baptized before you believed with all your heart in the Lord Jesus, all you did was take a bath. Right. Or had somebody you know, sprinkle you. That, that, that it didn't count. 
You know, that's not, it's, it's for people who get saved. That's why Peter is very adamant. He says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And what was he answered? Well, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went both down to the water, both Philip and, eunuch, and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when, he, and when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So again, in both of these examples we saw in the book of Acts this morning is that salvation precedes baptism. It comes before it. It's not a part of it. It's something that it, they are two separate things. Right. They are not uh, the same thing. Now, I like, I like the example here where, where, where uh, Peter, in our, in our previous example, you know, he says... Uh, can any man forbid water that these should be baptized? And I love, uh, I love the, uh, you know, the example of Philip too, where as soon as he hears the right answer that the man is saved, you know, he stops the chariot and he gets out and goes right down into the water, and they take care of it right then and there. And that's how I, that's the biblical example that we see of baptism. You know, we don't need to have. This is a pretty simple subject. This isn't something I think we need to have a two or three week, you know, Sunday school explaining to the people that are going to be baptized what it means. And, you know, we can cover this in one sermon. Right. You know, we could cover this in a pretty quick sermon and get this across pretty easily. But there are a lot of churches, that, that's not how they want to do it. They want to do the, the, the drawn out class. They want to sit there and teach on baptism for several weeks. You know, and I don't think they're giving people enough credit that they can pick this up pretty simply. So we don't want to hinder people. You know, we don't want to stop people from getting baptized. We want to make sure that if they're, they get baptized, as soon as we can get them baptized. I mean, if there's water there and they're saved, then, then, then let's get it done. Let's go get them baptized. Yeah. One, of the great re one of the main reasons we ought to do that is because it gives people, the people who are being baptized, it gives them joy. And if that's what we see here with the example of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. It says there that in uh, verse 39, and when they were coming up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and what did he do? And he went on his way rejoicing. Now, of course, a big part of that is because he understood the, the gospel, but he was also able to be obedient unto um, the command of being baptized. So what we see, off, this is a good example of this, the fact that obedience equals happiness. You know, when we obey the Lord, we obey his word for salvation, and that brings happiness. When we obey his word and obeying the command to be baptized, that's going to bring us joy. That's going to bring us happiness. Don't know that we're following in, in, in God's uh, ways, that we're following Him, that we're doing the things that please Him, and we're being on, and we're ple being pleasing to the Father. That's going to bring us happiness, happiness in our life, and that's a good principle. I mean, that's one thing that baptism, I think, kind of teaches people, is that you know it's it's one of the first steps, but there's many other things that the Bible you know commands us, many other things in the Christian life that we have to obey and, and make a part of our lives, and they're not always easy things. But if we obey those things, what they'll do is they'll bring us joy. They'll bring us happiness. The Bible says in 1 John 5, we'll read, it says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Mm -hmm. you know, his commandments should never be to us, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, what a drag. You know, oh, man, i got to obey the Bible. You know, if you obey the Bible, you're not going to have a lot of the problems that the world has. You're going to have a, a much better life. That's right. That's, which, that's what always... You know, it just boggles my mind about, you know, relations that I've had, you know, with my family and even friends and things like that. They mock the things of God. They mock you, me, uh, me and me. You've probably gone through this to some degree where they, they, they criticize you for being obedient to the word of God. But then they're the ones with all the problems. They're the ones whose lives are a mess. I'm not saying my life's perfect. I'm not saying my life is without struggles. I'm just saying, but there's a lot of extra baggage that I don't have because I've been obeying this book. You know, there's a lot of things that they have in their lives that they could get rid of and get taken care of if they would just get saved and start to follow God and obey his commandments. So that's a good thing that we can learn from, you know, baptism, is that when we obey the Lord, we go on our way rejoicing, that we can live a life that is happy and, and, and full. Right. Now, there is the false gospel, and I've kind of alluded to it already a few times. If you would, uh, just stay, if you go back to Acts chapter 2. So really, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, um, some of the basics of baptism. We'll look at a few other things. But at this point, I just want to kind of address the false, the, this false gospel that's out there, as I've kind of already mentioned a few times, that baptism is necessary for salvation, that faith and baptism have to go hand in hand, that you cannot have salvation without baptism. And we don't believe that. And one of, the, one of the passages that they'll turn to is in Acts 2, verse 38. The Bible says that Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, 
and, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. So let's see, aha, you see that? Peter said that you had to repent and be baptized in order to receive the remission of sins. Now, of course, we know that repentance that he's talking about is going from unbelief to belief, right. you know, to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, to turn from your disbelief in him into putting your trust in him. And then he says that, and they'll say, yeah, so okay, they'll agree with you there, but then they'll say, but you also have to be baptized in order to receive the remission of sins. But that's not what he's saying. Now, when we kind of read this, because, you know, we don't, we don't speak in the same style of English exactly as the King James has written. You know, it's, it's written a little differently than the way our, our manners of speaking today. But what he's saying there when he says to be baptized for the remissions of sins, he's not saying be baptized so that your sins can be remitted. He's saying be baptized because your sins are remitted. You know, if you repent and believe on Christ, your sins are remitted. Therefore, be baptized. Be baptized for the remission of sins. That's how I understand this verse. Because how else would you explain it? I mean, you have to take this verse in the light of all Scripture. That's right. And you have to you have to uh, compare spiritual things with uh, spiritual things. So we see that remission simply means the cancellation of a debt. You know, it means the. Uh, getting rid of a debt, a charge, or a penalty. And that's what happens when we get saved. When we believe on Jesus Christ, you know, our sins are paid for through the blood of Christ. You know, he, we have the remissions of sins. Go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 10. If you're going to Acts chapter 10, I'll read to you from Matthew 26. For this is my blood of the New Testament. So this is Jesus Christ speaking. He said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. He's saying that his blood is the remission of, is what's shed for the remission of sins. That's right. You know, we're not filling up the tub this morning to get you clean from your sin. That's not why we're doing it. Yeah. We're doing that because you've already put your faith and trust in the blood of Christ for the remission of sins. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, make, I don't want to make light of the blood of Christ. I don't want to, you know, dilute the blood of Christ by saying that we have to add something to it. You know, we have to mix water with his blood and baptism. You know, the blood of Christ is all we need yeah, for remission of sins. And that's what he said here. You know, he didn't leave anything out when he went and shed his own blood on the cross. So again, we have to take Acts 2.38 and compare it with the rest of Scripture, and then we can have an understanding of what he means by be baptized for the remission of sins. Be baptized because your sins are remitted. The Bible says that you're there in Acts chapter 10, look at verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. So again, what's the one thing we got to do? It's simply believe. He didn't say believe and be baptized for remission of sins. He said here that the only thing you have to do is to believe in him, that whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. Now turn over to Mark chapter 16. Mark 16 is another one of these passages that they'll turn to and try to give, teach you the false doctrine that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. But we've already dispelled the one that we read there in Acts 2.38 where people would twist that scripture and tell you that you have to be baptized to receive the remission of sins. That's just not the case. We saw that. Now Mark 16, it, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So again, this is another one of their aha verses. And they'll say, see, you got to be baptized. you got to believe. That's not enough, though. You have to believe and be baptized to be saved. That's what Jesus said. Well, that Jesus did say that. I mean, that's a true statement, right? I mean, if you believe and are baptized, will you be saved? Yes. Absolutely. Because you did the one thing you need to do, right? You believe. And you can make that statement <clears throat> in a lot of different ways. You know, you can say, whosoever shall believe and chew bubblegum shall be saved. Is that not also a true statement? Yes. Who shall ever go, shall believe and go to the fridge and make a ham sandwich shall be saved. I mean, you, you know, we can have fun with it. You can tag whatever you want to do, for whatever you want on that. You can believe and do anything and be saved. That's how you got to understand this verse. Because that is a true statement, that if you believe and are baptized, you're saved. But you're saved because you believed, not because you were baptized. And the answer to this verse is in the verse itself. If you just continue reading the verse, you know, there's a semicolon there. That's where they like to stop. But the sentence goes on and says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Yeah. So what is the, per the person who's damned is the, one, the person who did the one thing. So if a person got baptized but didn't believe, then they're going to be damned. Why? Because they didn't believe. You have to believe in order to not be damned. That's right. Does that make sense? I hope that that's coming across right. Because that one thing that we have to do is simply believe. <clears throat> and it's important to understand these verses because these are the ones they try to trick people up on. So again, everyone that's getting baptized this morning, I'm, I, you know, I'm sure understands this concept. That salvation is by faith through grace alone. And if you don't understand it, then, you don't, then don't get baptized. 
you know, you need to get saved first. Make sure you have a saving knowledge of Christ. Okay? Now, um, what I, one, la one of the last things I want to touch on is the why, we do, why do we baptize the way we do? Okay? Now, we saw, first of all, that baptism is for believers, that, it's the, uh, that it, is not, it is not necessary for salvation. We talked about that. But now, you know, we're, we, we call ourselves Baptists, you know, so baptism is a big part of what we do. You know, we're, 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 we, get, we get excited about it. We go so far as to we actually buy, you know, water heaters and make sure the water comes out in 98. We encourage people, you know, it's going to be a nice warm 98 degrees. We bring the towels, you know, we get excited about it. You know, at least we should, as Baptists, we should get excited about baptism. It's something that should, should thrill us, um, you know, that... that that people are getting right with God, that people are getting saved, that people are desiring to walk with the Lord. That's what that means. That's a sign of a, of a good church, a church that's growing and thriving, is when you start to see baptisms taking place. So what I want to talk about real quick is just baptism is by immersion, by full immersion, to be, go all the way under the water and come all the way up. You know, if you got saved, then you had, you know, somebody just throw water on you and you didn't get baptized. Baptism is by full immersion. If you would, go over to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 3. I should have just keep something there. But we'll go back to Matthew chapter 3. Again, and we'll look at the example of Jesus Christ's baptism. I mean, if anybody got baptism right, it's the Lord. It's Jesus Christ. He definitely did it the right way. Yep. So how did Jesus do it? Well, there in Matthew chapter 3, look at verse 13. Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and to comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be, so, uh, to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Now here's how Jesus was baptized. And when and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. You've got to catch that, those words. Out of the water. Okay? You know, this doesn't take a lot of, you know, a lot of powers of the mind to figure out that if you're going to come up out of something, you have to have gone down into it. That's right. Right? So he came up out of the water because he first went down into the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. Now, don't anybody get your hopes up this morning. Okay? That's not going to happen, right? If it does happen, then, and then I, I'll, we'll have to pinch ourselves and, and wake up. So <clears throat> this was very special for him, of course. But let's look, at a, let's, uh, let's look at another example over in John chapter 3. You're turning over to John chapter 3. I'll remind us what we just read in Acts 8. When Philip baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, they went down both into the water. Again, so we see them going into the water. He had to stop the chariot and say, hey, let's go down into the water to baptize you. I mean, wouldn't it have been a lot easier to just take the water? I and mean, I'm sure the guy had water that he was traveling with, you know, in a, in a, a camel skin or whatever they used back then to carry water. He could have just, you know, <laughs> and baptized him. He could have sneezed on him, right, if it wasn't by immersion. He could have done anything. It would have been a lot easier than stopping the chariot, getting down, going down to the water. But he did it that way because that's how baptism is to be done. It's to be done by full immersion. And we'll explain why here in a minute. Now, here there in John chapter 3, we'll look at another example where baptism is by immersion. Or <clears throat> looks there in John chapter 3, verse 23. And John was baptizing in Anon near to Salem. Now, why was he there? I mean, if baptism is by immersion, he could have done it anywhere. You know what I mean? He could, have, he could have just gone and got a bucket and a ladle and just baptized people and just sprinkled them, and it would have been a lot easier. He could have got himself a spray bottle. You know, if, if baptism was just by immersion, wasn't by immersion, then we wouldn't have to go through all the trouble of setting up that tank. Think about how much easier it would be for me to just pull out the spray bottle after service and say, all right, all you that are getting baptized, line up. Just <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, praise the Lord. And, you know, you go on your way. You, you've been obedient. That wouldn't take a lot of effort. That wouldn't take a lot of... Uh, you know, uh, it wouldn't take a lot of effort on our part. And I think that's part of the reason why God chose immersion, because he knew it would actually take a little bit of effort on our part. You know, it took effort for uh, Brother Matthew to get the tank. It took effort. Not a lot. You know, it wasn't like we had we broke our backs or anything like that. But it took effort, planning, getting the heater down here, you know, bringing the towels, hooking it all up this morning, getting it filled up, you know. Um, so there's effort involved. Now we know, of course, it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the real reason. But, you know, it's another, it's kind of a side point that, you know, it takes effort to be baptized by immersion. He says there in John 3, he was baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there. So he was baptizing multitudes of people. So, of course, he needed a large body of water to do that. Why? Because baptism is by immersion. Right. 
it would have been a lot easier for him to do it if it wasn't by immersion. He wouldn't have gone there. He wouldn't have needed a lot of water. So we see, first of all, that baptism is not necessary for salvation. It's something that comes after salvation. It's something that shows us our obedience and desiring to walk in, in, with the commandments of God. It shows us, uh, we also saw that baptism is something that is done by full immersion. You know, it's something that is by, meant by going all the way under the water and coming all the way back up. And then we also see that baptism, basically what it is, you know, why, why are we getting baptized? Why can't, why can't you just go home and get baptized, you know, just at home by yourself, dunk yourself, you know, just take care of it one-on-one -on -one or whatever? It's because baptism really is a, is a public profession of your faith. It's a public display of what you believe inwardly. That's really what, what it is. It's a picture of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. <clears throat> if you want to turn over to Romans, uh, uh, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6. If you're going to Romans 6, I'll read you from Colossians chapter 2 where it says that we are buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from, dead, from, the, from the dead. So our, being, our baptism, when we're going down to the water, what we're showing people is that we are dead in Christ, that the old man has been crucified, and that the life which we now live in the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So that, you know, that's, that's what baptism is. It's a public profession of you showing the death of Jesus Christ and also the resurrection. You're there in Romans chapter 6, look at verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that, is like a, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So that's, that's what baptism is. It's showing us, hey, we're, we're walking in newness of life. We're walking in a new life in Christ. We're following after God. We've been born again. It's, and we do, that's why we do it publicly. That's why we do it at a church. That's why we show people and, you know, make a big deal out of it. That's why you're probably going to end up on the church's Instagram if you're getting baptized this morning. Because we want people to know. We've got people here that are getting baptized, that are following the Lord, and that love God, and, and, and we want to do that publicly. Amen. Now, if you would, uh, go over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I know we were just over there, but let's go back to John chapter 3. I want to think about that verse again. Because... You know, this, like I said at the beginning of the sermon, this is like, this is something I did preach recently, and maybe some of these points are, are something you're already familiar with or heard recently. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you've been going to a Baptist church for very long that you've heard sermons on baptism. At least you should have. You know, and it's something that's real simple. It's not the most complex and, and intellectually stimulating subject at times. Um, you know, maybe, maybe a better preacher could make it that way. I don't know. But... What I don't want us to lose sight of is the fact that baptizing people is exciting. It's an exciting thing. At least it should be. You know, that's, that's, that's what a, you know, a lot of churches lack. A lot of these dead churches, they don't have baptisms going on. If, you have, if you're in a church that doesn't have baptisms going on, you know, on, on somewhat of a regular basis, I'm not saying it has to be every service, but I mean, to sit, come down here today and sit up a tank and baptize five adults, I believe, and uh, several children, I mean... We are going to baptize today more people than some churches will baptize in a decade. And you think I'm exaggerating. I'm not. There are churches out there that are dead as a doornail. They have a baptistry. They have a nice, beautiful building. They've got a nice built-in baptistry behind the pulpit up on the platform. And there's cobwebs in it and spiders. You know, as Pastor Anderson likes to joke, that's where they put all the Christmas decorations. Right? It's just a storage space. But I've literally seen it with cobwebs and spiders and everything else. They've got to clean them out every, every time they get somebody baptized, you know, once in a blue moon. So we want to be excited about baptism. You know, some, we should be excited to be baptized. We should be excited about seeing baptisms. <clears throat> because baptisms are exciting. I mean, think about how serious John the Baptist was about baptizing people. You know, he's over here in John chapter 3. He was in down near to Salem the baptizing because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. In Mark 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written the prophets, Behold, I sent my messenger before thy face, which will prepare the way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went on unto him all the land of Judea and of Jerusalem, and they and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. I mean, can you imagine what a baptism service that was? When you've got all the land of Judea and all the land of Jerusalem coming out and being baptized by this one man in this river. I mean, that's exciting. That's, that's a thrill. That's, that's amazing. 
You know, we would love to see baptisms like that. What, would to God we could witness that one day. You know, I, I, whenever I read that and I think about that, I always, and I, I've used this example in the past, as I think about back where I'm from in Traverse City, Michigan, we have the Cherry Festival, which is a town of about, I don't know, 75,000 people maybe in the city. It's not very big at all. <clears throat> you know, the Tri-County area probably isn't even more, not even, a, a, you know, 100,000 people. It's, it's a very rural part of the, the country. But once a year, for la over the last 100 years, they have what's called the Cherry Festival because Traverse City, Michigan is the cherry capital of the world. At least it was. I think it still is. But they would produce more cherries there than anywhere else in the world. They would ship out a lot of cherries, so they have this thing called the Cherry Festival. And they've turned into this week-long celebration. It starts on the 4th of July, or if it ends on the 4th of July, I can't remember. But there's fireworks at the beginning and the end. The carnival comes to town. They bring in all the stupid rock bands, and they set up the midway. They close off the downtown. And in a week's time, about 3 million people come through that town, that little town in northern Michigan. 3 million people come through it. And that's like taking the entire city of Phoenix and just bringing them through. And every other year, what they have is they have uh, the Blue Angels come, which are the... Uh, I think they're F-14s or F-16s. And who knows who the Blue Angels are? The Navy Blue Angels, they do the air stunts, the, the Blue Jets. They'll come to town. That always draws a big crowd. And Traverse City, Michigan sits on uh, the Grand Traverse Bay. It has a 13-mile long, I think it's longer than that. It has a very long peninsula. Then you have West Bay and you have East Bay, which are two inlets out of Lake Michigan. So it's a real beautiful part of the country. But when you go down and you watch this air show, you'll stand out on the beach and you'll look down and just for miles, You'll just see for miles, literally miles, of, of just a crowd of people um, all along the Bayshore to watch these jets. And I think I always thought, wow. Whenever I get in like a stadium or wherever I see a large crowd of people, it's always amazing to behold that many people at once to see that a multitude like that. Now think about that. Would that now what, what if that crowd was there along that Bayshore, just tens of thousands of people, and there was just one guy standing out in the bay preaching to them, and then they just started coming, getting baptized one by one. And that'd be amazing. That would make headlines. That would, that, that's, that's something really special. But that's what we see here. When we see that baptism, baptizing people can be a very exciting thing, especially when there's large numbers of people being baptized. <clears throat> I mean, think about what Philip did. We read there in Acts chapter 8. And I won't have you go back there. But if you, if you, if you read Acts 8, you see Philip, he baptized an entire city, and then he baptizes one person in the same day. He goes and he baptizes an entire city, and then the Spirit tells him to go and join himself in this chariot, and he baptizes one guy. And I think they're both equally exciting, you know. And we see that baptizing large um, numbers of people are, are, is biblical. You know, baptizing people immediately after salvation is biblical or is close to. You know, sometimes the facilities don't always uh, lend itself to the, the, that convenience. You know, us, and we had people that were kind of waiting on baptism, and unfortunately we had to kind of, you know, uh, work out the, the kinks and make that happen. But, you know, seeing large groups of people be baptized is not only biblical, but it's also very exciting. So we should be excited to see others baptized. You know, I know, no, you know, if you're here today and you're not, you've already been baptized, and, you know, uh, don't ever let it turn to a lackluster thing. Yeah. I know up in Phoenix, you know, we got a lot of people, and I'm not, I'm not faulting anybody, but we, and we see a lot of baptisms. But I remember when I first got there, and we would announce baptisms after the service, say, hey, we're going to have baptisms outside. It would, like, you'd have, like, a few dozens, maybe just dozens of people out there. And I think we've kind of gotten used to seeing a lot of baptisms, and we have a lot of people now. We don't see, we, we don't see everybody flood out the door and, and, go, and go out there. We've just kind of gotten used to a lot of baptisms. But we should still be excited about seeing baptisms, about wanting to go see somebody and share in that moment with that person, because that's, that's a big step. I mean, some people kind of take it for granted. They don't mind, you know, getting up in front of people and, and, and allowing themselves to be seen of others and go through that process. Some people, that's a big step to have to, you know, have everybody looking at them, and then you're going to have some guy grab you and put you underwater and bring you back up. You know, it, it can be intimidating, you know. Uh, it, it can definitely, for some people. So we should never be, uh, take that lightly. We should always be excited about it, and we should always want to see that. I think that's something that's important. You know, we should be excited to see others baptized. And I think probably the most exciting people you'll ever see baptized are the people that you went to the Lord. And really, that's the kind of the application I want to end on this morning. And, you know, that, that's something I think we could all work on, self-included, is not just getting people saved, but encouraging them to take that next step, to come out to church and to be baptized. <clears throat> you know, Philip, he won that and baptized that city in the, in the same chapter. You know, he, he went out and won that guy, and then he baptized him. He was the one that did it. 
and, and he was able to, to take, you know, of course, he kind of, that was some low-hanging fruit on the guys like, hey, what do I, he's asking, what do I got to do to get baptized? You know, we don't necessarily have that when we knock on the door. I mean, people are, um, you know, they kind of have to be prodded, encouraged, and even taught that they need to be baptized. But really what we see is that it, it takes purpose and effort to get anyone baptized. You know, he had to go and join himself to the chariot. He had to preach him the gospel. He had to go down in the water and explain all that to him. And that's what we're going to have to do. If we want some, to see some exciting baptisms, which are going to be the people that we get saved, those will be the most exciting baptisms you've ever seen. When you get somebody saved, you get them to church, and you get them baptized, you're going to be excited about that person. You might even be more excited about it than they are. Because now you know you're not only... You, you take, it's like you've gone another step in walking with the Lord. You are fulfilling the, the, great, the great commission. You know, you're not just, not just preaching the gospel of a preacher, but also baptizing them and teaching them all things. You know, that's, that's three different things. You know, there's three steps to the great commission. You know, we focus a lot on just going out and winning, this, and winning the loss, which is great. I'm not downplaying it at all. We need to keep doing that. But we also need to be willing to take it to the next level at some point. And again, I'm preaching this to myself as much as anybody else. It's something I need to work on. It's getting people baptized, getting them to come to church and get baptized. Now, you're not going to get every single one. You know, you're not going to, you know, but if we're not making any effort at all to do that, I can guarantee you one thing, you'll never get anybody. But if we start putting forth an effort to do it, you know, we might get shot down a lot, you know, but, but we might, you know, eventually get somebody to come out and get baptized. I believe that. You know, I know up in Phoenix, there was a guy who goes out soul winning on the regular, and he had, I think, three people that he got saved and come out and get baptized all in the same day. You know, and I'm excited for that guy. I said, good job. You know, I thought, that's great. You know, and I, I was challenged by that. We should allow that kind of zeal to challenge us and to, to be even better uh, uh, soul winners in ourselves. I mean, we, we see, you know, but it's going to take effort. It's going to take a purpose. I mean, you think about, we'll, we'll close here, go to Acts chapter 16. You know, it's not going to happen on accident. You're not going to just, you know, not every person you knock on and get to the door and get saved is going to be that Ethiopian eunuch who's just going to get saved and then immediately they're going to they're gonna go to you like, hey, well, I want to get baptized now, what do I do? But it's probably not going to happen. You're probably going to have to talk to them about it. I'm not saying he has to ten, take another 15, 20 minutes going over baptism, but I think it's something we should at least be mentioning it's something we should at least have our, uh, you know, our radar on for. Hey, it's this guy. It sound like somebody who potentially might come to church. You know, that's how this church is going to grow. I mean, we're thankful for people who listen to Pastor Anderson and come out to this church. You know, and I'm sure there's more out there. But you know, that has there's a cap on that. You know, eventually you're going you're going to get all the listeners you're going to get, and the church is going to have to grow itself. And the way we're going to do that is by yes, going out and reaching them with the gospel but then encouraging them to be baptized and to follow the Lord and teaching them things whatsoever he commanded. That's how the church is going to grow, by encouraging people to come to church to be baptized. And it's going to take effort on our part. That's the point I want to make. That's what I want to close on. I mean, look at the effort Paul made. He said, well, that sounds hard. That sounds difficult. It, it, it might be, but I, I don't think it's going to be as what Paul went through. I mean, Paul uh, was cast into jail. Remember, and then there's the earthquake. And uh, the jailer goes to, to, to kill himself, to run himself through with the sword because all the jail doors were open. And Paul says, do thyself no harm, for we all hear. The jailer comes in trembling and falls down before him. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And then he preached unto him the word of God and to his house. And it says there in verse 33, And he took him the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. straightway. So after this, this guy gets, this jailer gets saved, he washes Paul's stripes. I mean, Paul's a guy who's been beaten, cast in jail, doesn't know what's going to happen next, but he still takes the time to preach this guy the gospel, and he even takes the time, despite his difficult circumstances, to remind him that he needs to be baptized too. And not just him, but his whole house. So I think if Paul can endure all of that and still, you know, have the mind to remind people that we get saved to be baptized you know we should be able to do the same so if you're going to do that if you're going to put forth that effort you're going to have to have a plan to baptize people and really I just want to give you if you have anything to write this down or if you want to talk to me about the service of reminding I have three simple verses three simple verses Matthew 28 19 is where we're going to show people you know, after you get somebody saved, you can say something just real quick. It doesn't have to be, a, you know, a, a, sit here and, and 
turn into this long, you know, conversation. You can just say, hey, you know, I'm glad you're saved. The next step for you is to get in church and get baptized. You know, if you want to be pleasing unto the Lord and live a life that he can bless, the next step of obedience to show them that you want to obey him as a child of God is to be baptized so that God can bless you. And you would show them uh, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19 where it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You say, see, it's God's will here that you would be baptized. He wants people who believe to get baptized. And maybe you could think of other verses that would be better to make this point. But you want to show them that it's God's will for them to be baptized. And you could turn over to uh, uh, Matthew. Matthew 3.16, we already read it. You can say, so God wants you to be baptized. And hey, the way you get baptized is by full immersion. And Matthew 3.16, of course, is the example of Jesus Christ. How uh, that he went down straightway into the water, or came up straightway out of the water after he first went down into it. So you can say, so we believe that baptism is by immersion. And we went all the way under and then you could just say, show them Acts 10, 48, which we talked about. Say and say, you know, it's, it's a command to be baptized. This is something you need to do. If, you know, but by, by then they've already, they're saved, so they understand that this is not part of their salvation. But that's something that they need to do in order to be pleasing to God. You know, maybe if we just took a minute and marked out a quick baptism road in their Bible, we could encourage people to be baptized. And then maybe you, one day, could get excited about seeing somebody that you got saved come out to church and get baptized. Yeah. But it's not going to happen if you're not willing to put forth the effort to see it happen. Let's go ahead and pray.